Hello and welcome to this buyer's guide on the MGB and this more specifically is an MGB GT and this is my MGB GT, a 1969 model. Built in 1969 this particular car was registered in 1970 and not to sound stereotypical but this is the quintessential British sports car and I'm going to tell you a wee bit more about it now and how you can find a good one. What most of what I'm going to tell you is relating to this model, but to be honest, there weren't huge changes throughout production from the early Mark 1s, this is a Mark 2, even going on into the rubber bumper models, largely similar, um, some small idiosyncrasies with the earlier models, but I'm going to tell you how you can find yourself a good one and this buyer's guide. First of all, I want to think about the bodywork. Um, as with most British cars of the era, rust is the main enemy. Um, these are all built from steel, this particular one being a Mark II and the Mark I's, I believe, also has an, an aluminium bonnet, but the rest of the body shell is made of steel, and steel likes to rust, especially in the British weather. So if you're watching this in the UK, rust is your number one priority. Probably in the dry states of America, not just so much of an issue. Um, things, Places to look out for rust is really anywhere, and I know that's not a helpful statement. First thing I would say is along these chrome finisher strips in the factory, the car was painted and then the, hill, the holes were drilled afterwards, so quite often you see rust appearing along the chrome finisher strips. And I will demonstrate that here. It's very typical. Now that's quite minor. I'm keeping an eye on this, but the car never really gets driven in the rain and is stored inside, so I'm not too concerned. Other places to look out for is along here. Um, this is where the wing joins the scuttle, and there is a little finishing piece of metal in here, and that often starts to go as is demonstrated here, although I know this is not too bad. Keeping an eye on that as well. Other places to think of in under here, feel along the lip of the wing. These wings are getting more and more expensive, um, so something to consider. Even in around the bottom of the headlights in these dishes, um, full of rust traps everywhere. So definitely to keep an eye out there. If your car is fitted with a sunroof, which this one is not, you'll want to check around the outside of the sunroof in case water is gathering in there. Moving around the rear, check in under here along the lip of the wing again as said and on round the back. Check for uniformity around your panel gaps and even in the panel gaps of the door. Just to make sure that there's no sag and see whenever you open the door you want to make sure the door doesn't drop. There's a slight bit of play in these hinges but I know that the B pillars are not rusty, but if your door drops or you need to lift it to close it, you need to be careful that there's not serious rust in the bottom of the door pillars. Another place to think of, if you reach up, if you are viewing a car, you reach up under here, there is a shelf and you'll feel it's like a box section with a shelf above it. Beautifully designed to hold water and therefore rust. So really important to check there. Moving on round, sills, those are a nightmare to fix, very expensive unless you can weld them yourself, they're in multiple pieces, so definitely want to keep an eye on that, um, as you can see mine aren't showing any signs of external rust and have been in underneath, a um, bit of bubbling here, I think it's fairly superficial, I um, feel like I'm pointing out all the bad points in my car but it's actually really sound, coming right into the boot then, You're going to want to lift the floor, which should be easy enough done. Underneath you have a spare wheel, and you're going to want to check around the boot floor, because if you have a rusty tailgate or a leaky tailgate, water's going to leak in there and gather. So something to think about. Moving on round, I have a bit of rust under here. I believe that's not particularly uncommon, and the same 
on this side as I've mentioned on the other side. Underneath, you're going to want to get the car up on stands if you're going to think of buying it. You've got spring hangers in here and under here. And if you bear with me, I'm just going to open the bonnet here and show you where you need to be thinking about rust under the bonnet. I realise I'm talking a lot about rust, but to be honest, that's a major thing here. You're going to want to look along those chassis rails, check that they're straight, check that there's no rust forming, especially up underneath, see them, the carbs there where they join the bulkhead. Look along the bulkhead, make sure your panels are nice and straight and down the other chassis leg and check this panel in front of the radiator and make sure it's nice and straight. You're going to want to check in bodywork that everything is as it should be. This strip here in a Mark II, it's quite hard to come by so it's good to have it if it's there. Look at the condition of the chrome. It um, can be a bit of a headache to fix. Um, and quite expensive if you need to do a whole car, so look at the condition of the chrome and you're going to want to look at the overall condition of the bodywork. This one, this car was painted by the previous owner who restored it himself um, and the paintwork's not too bad. It's a home paint job but there are a few watermarks and a few imperfections that will need looked at over time. So next up I'm going to think about the drivetrain. So, bonnet open again and having a look underneath. This is an 1800cc B series engine, and hence it's called the MGB. Um, this has got twin carbs, two SU carburetors, um, it's got points in ignition, alternator down here, water pump at the front, thermostat, fuel, fuel lines, fuel pump is down by the tank. Uh, you have your master cylinders for clutch and brake, heater, coil here, and radiator at the front. And then oil cooler down here. All actually very simple, very easy to maintain. Things you're going to look out for is, to be honest, generic things with a classic car. You're going to want to look under the radiator cap. Looking for any mayonnaise type emulsified oil and water, um, which this car very thankfully it doesn't have. You're also going to want to check the level of the oil, or level of the water, sorry, which is not going to show up all that well on camera, so sorry about that. Look at the general condition of the engine. Any obvious oil leaks, thankfully there aren't on this. Um, any modifications. Um, check your dipstick oil level. So oil, water. Um, check the condition of the wiring. Sorry, I haven't removed this. This was from a previous job. Um, Previous owner very kindly painted over my wiring. I don't really know why, but there you go. I have got electronic ignition fitted to this car, but the original point system is perfectly good. I am um, looking at the, the HT leads, not checking for any cracks or wear. These are silicon ones and they're fairly new. Over around to the carburetors, these are not the original air cleaners. Um, should have Cooper uh, air filaments with a bridging pipe in between them. So that's something that's not completely original in this car, but I quite like it to be honest. Gives a really good induction noise. Checking around the fuel pipes for leakage. As you can see, this is new, um, especially with increased ethanol content in fuels. We're going to have to really keep an eye on these in classic cars. Looking around the radiator, checking for any dampness along the bottom, make sure there's no leaks. Oil cooler, check there's no leaks around here. Um, just general common sense things you'd look for really in any classic car. Thinking then round. My car, particular car does not have an overdrive so it's a four-speed manual. Um, quite a lot of cars do have overdrives and it does make them more desirable and therefore more expensive. So reverse is away and back and then a one two three four and an H pattern. Some of the overdrives are controlled from the gear knob. Some of them otherwise have a switch here. Um, my previous owner of this car wired a heated rear window into the overdrive switch site. Um, personal choice, I suppose. Um, and there's other overdrives are controlled off the indicator stock. Four speed manual, as I said. Uh, brakes, drums at the back, discs at the front, very easy to maintain. Um, and the handbrake is mechanical acting on the rear. Uh, sorry, not mechanical, it's by cable uh, acting on the rear, but it's not hydraulic. Suspension 
is by leaf springs in the back um, with Armstrong lever arm dampers and on the front is also Armstrong lever arm dampers but there are coil springs in the front which makes for good handling um, and some of the later models have anti-roll bars fitted this one does I believe the mark one didn't but, I, but I'm prepared to be corrected in that sorry about that you made me jump also thinking of drivetrain this particular car is fitted with wire wheels um, I really like the wire wheels, I think they look very smart. The very early Mark 1s have steel wheels um, with chrome hubcaps and then the later ones also have, went back to steel raw style type wheels. Um, lots of limited editions in between and so on but those are your main things. With the wire wheels you really need to be careful. No rusty spokes. Um, that can be terminal on a wire wheel and you really don't want the, the rim separating from the hub. Um, Make sure your spinners are nice and tight. Um, jack the car up if you can and check for play within the splines on the wheels because that can be uh, quite an expensive job to fix really. So that's looking at the drivetrain. So moving on to the interior. Um, the MGB, well the GT model is a 2 plus 2. The MGB Roadster really is a two-seater. Um, I think this era of interior is absolutely brilliant. I love the contrast of the black with the silver. Um, I think it just looks so smart. Very simplistic interior, very comfortable. Things you need to look out for. Seats, um, like mine, are they sagging? Is that a job that's going to need done? Um, are they correct for the period? Mine are, but the seat covers don't match, which I'm not really sure about the story behind that. Um, are the carpets in good enough condition? Mine are, I think to be honest they could do with a bit of a smarten up, but they work very well. Has it got the right steering wheel? So this is the correct wheel for this car, they, they call this the banjo type, for obvious reasons. And um, When I got this this had a horrible aftermarket steering wheel, so I did hunt high and low to get that. And it was fairly expensive to be honest for a steering wheel, but it's got the right one now. Other things you're going to want to look for in the dashboard, this wrinkle finish coating isn't good nick. As you can see there's a few wee chips in mine and that will be done. Um, some cars have a radio up here, some cars even have a, a hidden speaker in behind there which I think is pretty cool but it's generally aftermarket. Um, as you can see there's a bit of windscreen delamination in this one, something you'll want to look out for. And all the other thing to look out for is a sagging headliner which mine also has. Again, I feel like I'm pointing out a lot of faults, but I'm quite pleased with this car. Back seat, well, it's up to you. I don't think it's particularly usable in this day and age. Maybe back in the time that it was built, but if you can put a child in there and be happy with the safety, fair enough. Um, manual gearbox, as I said, three pedal arrangement, very conventional. Um, make sure all, if you're buying, make sure all the knobs, switches and lights are working. Um, as I'm sure you would, check the dashboard for any cracks. I suppose in the hotter states of America, you're gonna to wanna to be cautious of that. Um, the later rubber bump -bum models, some of them had sort of uh, fabric deck chair type covers. So they're probably more prone to wear and tear. Other than that, not a huge amount else to talk to you about in the interior. It's generally, is it smart? Does it look good? Are the seats in good neck? Is it gonna cost you a lot to get it put right? So just some final thoughts then on the MGB. This is an MGB GT. There's the MGB is the Roadster. There's the Mark 1s, which are the very early ones. Um, they have very earliest ones have a different door handle, which is a pull-up type rather than a press button. Um, then it went through the Mark 2. Then there were changes around the grill um, with a honeycomb type plastic grill. Um, going through all the various iterations is a topic and a video in and of itself. Um, then they went to the rubber bumpers in the mid 70s. Um, the rubber bumper cars generally sit a bit higher because the bumpers were heavier and the cars needed to sit higher for the American regulations. And then there were a number of limited editions as well. Uh, cars like the LE and the um, ones, special editions like that you can come up with. Um, very long production run, very successful car. Values vary hugely. Um, there's no point in me going into values in this video because the video will be up and 
for a long time and the values will change but generally the earliest mark one cars are worth the most and the latest rubber bumper cars are worth the least roadsters got a bit of a premium over gts i feel although i'm happy to be corrected in that overdrive also increases the, the value of your car so lots to think about chrome bumpers generally get a premium over rubber bumpers but i think there's been a bit of a renaissance with uh, rubber bumper cars um very smart motors very usable a lot of people i know of use them as their daily drivers and i see no reason why you couldn't um unfortunately my job doesn't lend itself to that but um i definitely think it, it could be usable um very easy to work on by yourself as well i've done all the work myself on this one since i bought it including an engine out job a new cylinder head rear suspension everything so very happy and i hope that has been of some use to you if you have any questions about buying an mgb at all please feel free to ask me i'll point you in the right direction um, i hope you find that some useful and if you're in the market that that will help you with some of the common pitfalls in buying these cars um, Please feel free to comment in the video below. I reply to all my comments and absolutely hit the subscribe button if you want to keep up to date with my classic car collection. There's the MG, and there's the Land Rover, and the Mars Minor is in storage. So once again, thanks for watching. Keep up to date with me by hitting that subscribe button. See you next week. Goodbye.